Welcome, everyone, to day four, wow, of Sci-Fi 2020. Um, I hope everyone is getting as much out of the sessions and tutorials as I have been. Um, it's uh, been some absolutely fascinating presentations. Dr. Ian Carr uh, is both an institute scientist and Merkin Fellow at the Broad Institute uh, of Harvard and MIT, uh, specializes in algorithms and strategies uh, involving uh, images, large scale data and images. And so uh, wonderful illustrations of the power of uh, images and visualization uh, and analysis. Dr. Carpenter's uh, open source cell profiler software is used by thousands of biologists worldwide. Um, and uh, she has built up a, um, whoop, lost my slides here, sorry. Uh, and an impressive record of uh, external recognition, uh, winning an NSF Career Award, an NIH Mira Award. She was at the time the youngest uh, inductee into the Massachusetts Academy of Sciences. Um, She's a genome technology rising young investigator and is listed in Deep Knowledge Analytics, top 100 AI leaders in drug discovery and advanced healthcare. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Carpenter for her talk on uh, the use of images in a range of applications from drug discovery and functional genomics uh, and other biological arenas. Well, thank you so much for joining in for this session. I'm really happy to be here today. I know many of you are facing some difficult uh, medical or economic issues because of the pandemic. There's racism. There's all kinds of things to be uh, discouraged about in the world. But I hope that this will be a, a glimmer of good cheer as you see how open source bioimage analysis software has made some dramatic impact in the world of drug discovery. So I'm hopefully introducing some of you to this um, topic for the first time and uh, uh, eager eager to see what you think of it. So you are probably familiar with Moore's Law. This is the great uh, technological advancement that's been made over the past decades in terms of how cheap computing has gotten. And because this is a log scale, it's really a dramatic improvement over time. But I'm guessing very few of this audience is aware of Arum's Law, which is Moore's Law backwards. And it just uh, is equally discouraging um, describing the cost increases in discovering new medicines from the research and development to the clinical trials and so on, it's gotten more and more expensive over time to the point where if you had a billion dollars in the 50s, you could get 30 drugs on the market and today it doesn't even get you a single drug created. Um, and that's just uh, tremendously depressing, especially as um, as you can consider all the technological advancements, the human genome being sequenced, um, automation coming into play, and yet we've been unable to break this curve in the drug discovery industry. Now, I should say that the Arum's law was published 10 years ago, and there's a little bit of an improvement in, in this law. It's um, now a billion dollars might get you one drug, uh, but still, I think we can all agree that discovering drugs better, faster, cheaper would be of, of great utility. So today I will talk about some of the image analysis software that's been developed in my lab and uh, I'll talk about its impact in the, the biomedical world, but I'll also be focusing, as you can see throughout, on the non-technical. Um, what are some of the um, interesting social impacts? What are the, um, the how did we fund our, our research uh, and so on? So some of the things that may be quite relevant to those of you studying uh, creating open source software in all kinds of different domains. So let's begin with our first uh, so uh, software project called Cell Profiler. And this software's job is to turn images into numbers, um, which ultimately get turned into knowledge, uh, which ultimately hopefully get turned into drugs. Um, and we begin with the premise that in order to, to discover drugs that have the right impact on human patients, we need to understand how those drugs impact the cell. And here, these are some examples of cells. And to a cell biologist's eye, there's just a tremendous amount of information here, not just that they're pretty, but there's a lot of information in terms of the patterns of the different proteins that have been labeled. How are they connected and related to each other? What are the shapes and sizes of the different cells that might be interacting in a in a tissue, for example, just tremendous amounts of information are present in these cells. 
And what we typically do, do in drug discovery, I should say at the Broad Institute, it's an academic nonprofit institution. We do some drug screening, but it's done at a much larger scale in pharma. Still, the process is relatively similar. In the old days, uh, researchers might have used Petri dishes, but in the modern era, we use these multi-well plates. They can be typically 384 wells, sometimes 1536. And um, each of these wells is a little test tube or a little Petri dish where at the cells are put in, they sink to the bottom, and then you can image them through a microscope through the clear bottom of these plates. And so you, you pipette, like as shown here with automation, you add different drugs to the wells, you add different um, treatments, maybe different genetic perturbations, maybe you test different patient cell lines. All of that together um, allows you to test for potential treatments for disease. And so in the typical kinds of experiments, I'll just lay out how these experiments are typically set up and then we'll talk more about the software that's used. But typically you use all these robots to set up the samples into these plates. You use an automated microscope that works around the clock, snapping pictures of different fields of view, different regions within each of these wells. Each tiny well, they look absolutely minuscule when you consider the size of a plate is, is roughly this. Um, but it turns out you can capture um, usually a, a couple dozen of these kinds of pictures from the bottom of each well. So you get thousands of, of cells for each well. And then image analysis is necessary in order to identify each of the cells or the cellular compartments that have been fluorescently labeled or tagged with these, these red and blue and, and other color dyes. So that's the image analysis step. It's called segmentation, where you're segmenting the image into pixels that represent the different structures that you're interested in. And once you've performed segmentation, then you can just measure all kinds of things. And this is thanks to uh, software such as uh, scikit-image, uh, scipy, numpy, where you can count each of these blobs. You can measure their all kinds of metrics of shape, all kinds of metrics of size, as well as the intensities and the textures of the different fluorescent stains that are present. So all those patterns can be really important for a biologist to understand the impact that a certain drug, for example, is having on a certain set of cells. So all those kinds of features can be measured, um, really thousands of features can be measured for each individual cell in every image, in every well. So we end up with tremendous amounts of data. Uh, that, therefore, in my talk today, we're going to talk uh, first about image analysis, but then eventually switch more towards data science because, because of the, um, the trend in that direction with these large experiments. So I wanted to mention some of the um, impact that the software that we've written Cell Profiler um, in Python has had on patients. And the we've, we're aware of two successful clinical trials so far. The first one shown on the left here is a, leuke a type of leukemia, type of cancer, where um, we are looking for drugs that cause the cells to become uh, larger. But when I say larger, I mean their DNA is duplicating, but the cells themselves are not um, continuing to proliferate. And this, uh, this just showed preliminary um, clinical trial positive results last year. And another experiment we had absolutely nothing to do with, uh, we were not analyzing the images shown here. What happened in this kind of an experiment is patients came in with severe uh, types of cancer that were not responding to any treatment. So what they did is, um, of course, they excised the tumors that they were able to excise. They put the cells in a dish and then added different potential chemotherapies. So already approved FDA um, uh, approved cancer drugs. And they checked to see which of the drugs was most effective for this particular patient's cancer. And uh, together with the doctor's knowledge of the patient and of the drugs, they would choose one based on the image-based output from the cells growing in a dish. And so this is a personalized medicine kind of application where the software was, was used to guide treatment. There's also some clinical trials in progress from a company called Recursion, and I'll talk about their method for uh, identifying potential therapies towards towards the end of the talk. So lots of impact on patient, but, but I wanted to go a little behind the scenes and talk about the software that, that made this happen. So Cell Profiler um, today is, uh, is a free open source software, 9,000 or so citations in the, in the academic literature, but of course it's used quite beyond that in, in pharma companies and, and biotechs as well. Um, it was written in Python, and I think what's um, quite dramatic about the, its history um, is that it's uh, 
typically been supported or created by a single person at a time. So we've very rarely in its history have we had two full-time people working on Cell Profiler. In fact, it's generally been a half a person or maybe one person over its um, trajectory. But for that one person on average over time to have this amount of impact on the biomedical world to me is, is just astonishing. I'm just happy that we live in a world where things like this are possible. I think one of the reasons Cell Profiler has been so popular among biologists is that it was developed on a team of researchers who are intensively using it every day. So we eat our own dog food and um, add the features that we that we believe are necessary and are continually interacting with researchers who are new to image analysis so that um, we understand what it's like to get them going. So uh, the goals that we had in mind when we created this software is that we wanted to bring powerful image analysis methods such as this um, at the time it was a bit revolutionary to be able to um, be able to divide cells that were um, that were next to each other into two separate compartments instead of just counting at, at one as one. Uh, we wanted to bring these methods into the hands of biologists, but we knew that our audience, myself included at the time, uh, was much more comfortable with point and click software. And so we really wrote the software to be very user friendly, especially in terms of the help. So explaining the image analysis methods to somebody who is coming from outside the field. We also knew that it, the software would need to be very flexible and modular um, because biologists do all kinds of interesting things with all kinds of cell types and species and diseases that they're studying and fluorescent lit tags that they're using. And so this flexibility was really crucial. Um, we also wanted it to be useful for small and large experiments. So a great many people use Cell Profiler to literally process one one image and some of us use it to process literally millions of images in in very large experiments and so it has that kind of flexibility and it supports reproducible research which I think we can all agree is much appreciated when people publish their results so a bit of its history I st I personally started writing it in MATLAB in 2003 that was before NumPy existed um, and the what was interesting at the time maybe not too impressive now but at the time we released this the code publicly before we published a paper on it and that we had a lot of pushback from uh, especially some senior folks and colleagues on this but uh, I think it's really the wave of the future and of course today is, is pretty common. We then um, rewrote the MATLAB version in Python and you can see kind of the statistics here. The reason we we emerged from the MATLAB world is because we got pretty frustrated waiting for MATLAB to fix bugs that we desperately needed to make our software work. The installation experience was rather poor. Some of you may remember at the time, if you wanted to distribute something written in MATLAB, you had to have a separate, um, uh, separate install, a separate um, MATLAB engine together with your with your code, and then thing, they would be out of alignment in terms of the versions of them, and so on. So it was pretty frustrating that way. And then cost. It, MATLAB was free, was free at many U.S. universities because there was a, a site license, and we, it was sort of in the water. But at many places, especially in Europe, um, when you when you have a million images to process, you can't just license your entire cluster very cheaply. Um, you might ask, why did we switch from MATLAB to Python instead of Java? And the answer is really just dumb luck. Um, so we took a survey of Cell Profiler users at that time, a small, a much smaller crowd than it is today. And the vast majority of them did not care one bit what language um, we wrote Cell Profiler in. Here's a, a testimonial of one of the responses to the survey that they felt the need to elaborate um, that you people can do all the programming. Um, when it came to Python versus Java, it was a vote of 18 versus 17. Um, and I can't say that's the only thing that made the decision. It was also, I think, um, Lee Kamensky was the software engineer at the time that, thank goodness, he was just very open to whatever people are interested in, in doing. And uh, we saw Python on the upswing. So we, we jumped on that horse. And it's a, it's a very nice thing that we did because we've been able to stay in that language ever since with um, several releases. And it's still it's very active project today as a result. So I want to say a big thank you to all the projects that are crucial for Cell Profiler. And I apologize if I've skipped any. I think I've got most of them here um, upon which our, our software would just not be possible um, without so much work that goes into it. So to some degree, the, um, the cancer patients that are walking around in Vienna today um, and in Chicago um, can thank you as well for the, the work that you've done in creating these foundational tools that help uh, keep our software project healthy. 
So speaking of keeping software alive and healthy, um, I thought I could share some guidance um, on, on what we've done that has made this more possible. So first of all, I think it's valuable when you're starting out a coding project to make a choice about your target audience and just commit to serving that audience well. Not every software project has to be user friendly. Not all of it has to serve outsiders um, beyond just yourself. So first of all, do you really want it to serve the scientific community or is it okay if it just serves you and your lab? Um, do you want to help computationalists only versus domain experts that need a more polished interface? It's a pretty big divergence if you need to add the documentation and the kind of fit and finish that's necessary for domain experts to be really comfortable in the software. So that's a decision to make. Um, and, and in each of these decisions, I'm encouraging folks, you know, don't land in the middle where you spend a lot of energy, but don't actually meet the goal. Like if you're, if you're going to, if it's going to serve computationalists only, that's fine. Just, just do that. Don't try to make it user friendly and, and have it just not, not meet that goal. Cause you'll spend a lot of energy in that direction without a lot of payoff. Um, and lastly, contribute to existing tools and libraries where you can. So it's easy at the beginning of a project and um, to say, well, I could, I could write something from scratch easier than I could add the feature that I need to an existing tool. But you really have to think about the lifespan of the project overall and your commitment to maintenance in the long run. So when I began the, each of the projects that, we've, um, that we'll talk about today, I did due diligence and really researched the field to see, is, does something new actually need to exist here? Or or can I add on to something um, that's that's already there and, and supported? If you can share the maintenance, if you contribute to somebody else's um, toolbox, then um, it's true you may not get quite as much credit up front, but you also have much less maintenance over your lifetime, um, as well as you know not spending time reinventing wheels, building chunks that are in common across the two. So something to consider. Secondly, leverage your time. I think burnout is a huge um, problem for many of us working in open source software, there's always going to be an endless supply of requests for either help or improvements to the software. So one suggestion is to make sure that your efforts are public and searchable. Um, so we have online forum for Q&A for our, our software. Uh, and that's, I think, really crucial for um, other people being able to search and find answers to questions instead of pestering, um, pestering again. There's a couple of uh, articles mentioned here. Oh, and I should say overall that these slides are available. I'll, I'll share a link at the end as well so that you don't need to necessarily um, jot down or screenshot all of these different resources. I'll, I'll share that at the end as well. And then lastly, finding funding. Um, it's a challenge. And so in some domains, for example, for biomedicine, we have the National Institutes of Health. Many of you, it's appropriate to go to the National Science Foundation. And of course, overseas, you've got all kinds of um, different agencies that support software to some degree. Um, one thing that we found very helpful for securing funding has been to track uh, usage and uh, to survey users. Um, so tracking usage uh, at the beginning, uh, unfortunately, you don't have a lot to go on, maybe just downloads and launches and executions. I think the the, the ideal for many domains, the ideal readout is citations, but um, papers could take 18 months to eight years to come out after somebody uses your software to, to actually have it show up in a published form. So um, you need some of these more proximal um, usage statistics to demonstrate the utility of, of your software. And of course, they come with some privacy concerns as well. Um, but don't discount things like a question and answer forum because people asking questions about the software is another way to prove that, um, that it's being used. And surveying users, if you're writing a grant saying we're going to add this and such um, feature to the software, it certainly helps if you can say 87% of our users um, find, would, would find this feature valuable. Um, for funding, I would say um, it's been really amazing to see a couple of um, sources come out that provide support for open source. And when I say support for open source, I mean the, the boring maintenance bits. Um, so it's uh, kind of the difference, as, as I was quoted here, of being, between having insurance versus a GoFundMe. So if you're trying to support your, um, if you're trying to support the maintenance of your software on the back of grants that are meant to be doing new things and providing new features and accomplishing new science, um, it can just be really challenging. And so um, Chan Zuckerberg was, to my knowledge, one of the first to offer funding for the boring bits of software um, development, the sort of maintenance, the upgrading to new operating systems and to new dependencies tendencies, which um, doesn't impress anybody on the science side, but is absolutely necessary for the, the software to stay um, healthy over time. 
Okay, so future. What's the future in this um, in, in the in image analysis for biologists? We definitely want to bring deep learning to biologists. So cell profiler is kind of a pipeline based system where you choose different image processing functions and and stick them together, um, kind of like a Jupyter notebook might be. Um, but in this case, it's a it's a very visual um, uh, point and click kind of interface for that. But compare that against your um, your photo software on your on your phone or on your computer, where it just knows the members of your family. It just um, you don't have to tell it what microscope or what camera did you use to take these pictures. Is it, is it an RGB image or is it CMYK? You just you spew images in and it somehow magically identifies uh, the people in the images and, and labels them. And in the same way, we really foresee a future where biologists don't have to think so hard about image analysis. We'd like to take this off their, their plate so they can focus on disease research. And one of the ways we can do that is to try to replicate the biologist's head. So any biologist just looking at an image can can outline nuclei as, as shown here, or um, it requires experts to identify the different stages of the malaria life cycle. But we would like to train deep learning models that just know what these objects and uh, phenotypes look like in images. Towards that end, we organized a uh, Kaggle competition uh, a couple years ago called the Data Science Bowl, where the goal was not so much here's a set of outlined images, let's produce a trained model that can uh, find them well. That's a pretty easy task and there's all kinds of um, architectures and and so on that, um, that, that allow you to, to choose a good option there. We were really curious, can we train a single model or not so much we, but can these uh, 4,000 teams eventually that participated, can you all train a model that is capable of identifying nuclei, acro nuclei across very diverse images? So you can see some of the examples here. The, the colors that are used are very different. Some These are tissue samples, whereas this is cultured cells. Um, really distinct species, stains, everything's um, very diverse across these. And we um, were delighted to find that uh, the outcome of this coding challenge produce some trained models that do not require any tweaking. So in um, here's a, a reference of cell profiler. This is an expert spending maybe 20 minutes to an hour or so tweaking the image processing pipelines. By contrast, not only do these results here produce better results, but there's absolutely no tuning required whatsoever. So you just give it the image. It produces a result. There's no parameters or anything. Um, one of these was uh, one uh, similar version to these was uh, implemented. You can check it out at nucleaizer.org um, that the Horvath Lab implemented. And it's really lovely. Just drag and drop your image that shows some nuclei in it. Uh, probably also works to a reasonable degree with blueberries or balloons or other sort of roundish things. Um, and it just does a pretty decent job of it. Um, we also have some uh, some baseline um, uh, um, implementations in GitHub um, that our lab has produced to kind of facilitate this field. So that's one of the things we've been working towards. But it's clear that our lab is certainly not going to um, do the majority of the work in this. Um, in this field. There's far too much that's needed to bring deep learning into biology and, and to other domains, which I'm sure many of you are working on. You need annotation tools. You need a repo for the, uh, the ground truth. You need the strategies and some software to train the models, ideally in a way that uh, an end user could, could do rather than an expert. Um, if trained models are useful to others, then you would want a public repo for those, as well as software to then fine tune it to your particular application and then software to run a model on a million images um, in a way that doesn't require much expertise. Um, and then, of course, we also need um, people to answer questions uh, for those that are outside of the field uh, of computer vision. And so all of this is um, pretty overwhelming. It's definitely something that requires a full community of people working on different steps of the, of the process. And in fact, I, I wanted to point out that um, whereas Cell Profiler and, and most of the existing bioimage analysis software today takes a very pipeline approach a very data flow um, model of, of the problem. So images come in, various image processing filters happen, various measurements are made, and then you get stuff spit out the, uh, the end. Um, we foresee a world where we can take a more end-to-end -end approach with these neural networks. So for example, if I have just completed an experiment with a million images from all kinds of different drug treatments, can I feed those in 
to uh, a system and have it in an unsupervised way group all the images into biologically meaningful groups based on the morphology of the cells in each image. Um, or can I say these um, these patients have this disorder, this version of a disorder, and these patients have a different version of the disorder? Is there anything different about them um, in, a, in a more supervised classification problem? And so we, we see things moving in, in that direction. Thank goodness, uh, the National Institutes of Health um, just uh, awarded um, funding for this area of research, and it's allowed us to establish the Center for Open Bioimage Analysis just a few months ago. It's between myself, I, I lead the Cell Profiler Project, and Kevin Ellisari at University of Wisconsin is leading the ImageJ project. And together we um, aim not to do all of the work described on the prior, prior slide, but instead this, this word catalyze is really crucial here. Our goal is to catalyze the community and do all the thankless bits that allow the community to develop good solutions in this space um, that are user friendly for biologists. The second type of software I want to talk about today that's, um, that we've been working on is machine learning to classify cells. So Cell Profiler Analyst was the first tool we made in this space. And the basic idea actually starts with Cell Profiler. You um, process images and spew out all kinds of features. So we've already talked about these features, texture, shape, size, and so on. So after you identify the regions of interest, those are ROIs, um, which in our case are cells, you measure all their features using Cell Profiler, and then you feed them into Cell profiler analyst and you present uh, handfuls of images to the biologist who then scores them. Do they have the appearance that she's looking for or not? And um, as the biologist is looking at the individual pictures of cells and saying, yes, I'm looking for cells that have this like funny blobby attachment to them. Meanwhile, the computer is looking, of course, at the metrics for each image and identifying what are the rules um, or the classifier that can distinguish the um, positives from the negatives, the yeses from the nose. And because this is an iterative cycle, it gets better with each round. And uh, eventually you have a nice classifier that can take billions of cells, identify each one. Does it, does it have the phenotype or not? Is it, does it have in this case, the blobby um, projection or not? Um, this kind of a uh, project, um, this is, sorry, this is what the, the tool looks like uh, to a biologist. You can pretty much ignore all the gibberish that, that it spits out unless you're an expert. But for the most part, you just, it's very easy and rather fun to use. You have all these different bins that the biologist wants to sort cells into. And as they're doing this um, sorting, the computer is getting better and better at detecting what it is that they're looking for. So some of the things we've been able to accomplish with this kind of a tool are, are shown here. A leukemia project where we were distinguishing this cobblestone appearance of cells versus um, not. Uh, in this experiment, we identified some drugs that could cause liver cells to proliferate in culture, which is fantastic. If you know um, anybody who needs a liver, it's a very long waiting list and there's not enough material um, for human patients, not to mention to do research on. And so being able to get hepatocytes to proliferate and culture uh, is a tremendously valuable thing uh, that, that this team accomplished. Um, we can also do things with um, whole worms. These, these worms have been identified and then um, laid out in a, uh, let's see, how do you describe it? Just unfolded into an atlas so that they can be put together in a lineup here. Carolina Walby worked on this set of algorithms that allowed us to look for genes that um, affect fat metabolism uh, with obvious clinical implications there and so on. So behind the scenes on Cell Profiler Analyst uh, was begun just a few years after Cell Profiler. So this project's uh, 15 years old. We wrote the first version here in Java and again, publicly released it before we published it. But then very quickly thereafter, we rewrote it in Python. It didn't take that much time because it's a much smaller project. And um, this here, the motivation for moving to Python was so that it would be in the same language as Cell Profiler because they share some of the same tools. The classifier that I showed is, is the main meat of Cell Profiler Analyst, but there's also all these visualization tools which were shared in common between Cell Profiler. Um, this project almost died, I would say, in this interim period not shown here. We didn't have any funding specifically for it, and it was just too much to, to keep track of, um, to keep both projects healthy, so it sort of withered for a while. The only reason it's really alive today is because a couple of students in 2016, Jane Hung and David Dao, um, were able to upgrade the code, upgrade the dependencies especially, and, and sort of bring it back to life. So I'm very grateful for that stage of its history. 
And looking towards the future, we have a, a new tool that will take on this function called Piximi. Alan Goodman and David Dow have been working on this. And what's really cool is that it will replace not just cell profiler analysts in my lab, but a lab we work very closely with. It's a very highly functional and um, friendly community. Peter Horvath's group had, um, had inadvertently made a very similar tool to ours around the same time. We just didn't know each other existed. And so now that we know each other exists, we're working together on a new tool that is going to be a web-based app using um, some deep learning algorithms instead of the classical machine learning um, that's available in Cell Profiler Analyst. And uh, we're, our rationale for moving this to a web-based tool that, that uses these uh, underlying algorithms is just to ease the installation and, and build process, so to speak, um, especially with TensorFlow. That's a real challenge. Um, and also just to give us platform independence as well. So this um, app is still under construction, very, very alpha beta version. So, um, but I, 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 um, it's definitely the, the wave of the future for, for cell classification. And then hopefully, ultimately, um, image analysis and segmentation as well. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to shift more towards data science. But if you're interested in image analysis in general, I wanted to point you to a couple of communities. Um, New Bias is in Europe and Bina is in North America. And um, there's also several resources, educational resources, image forum. If you have any image analysis question on any software, you can post it there and get some expert feedback, as well as this iBiology video course if you're really a beginner and want to get um, get into this field. All right, so now we turn to the data science. So the last thing I want to talk about are some libraries that we've been building. Um, to profile cells. So Cytominer and Deep Profiler are their names. And when I say um, profile cells, what, do I, what does that mean? So morphological profiling, maybe some of you have heard of transcriptional profiling. It's okay if you haven't, but this is a very similar concept where we use images to create a signature of a gene or a compound or a disease. So the cells in this picture have come from a certain patient or they've been treated by a drug or a genetic perturbation. There's something interesting as far as the sample goes here. And our question is, has that interesting difference changed the appearance of cells? And one way we can ex extract that is to measure all the features that I spoke about before and um, extract them in a way that we can then look at the similarities of these numerical matrices and develop hypotheses about which one, which samples are similar to each other and which are not. So whereas in the first two software tools I described, our goal was very much to assist a biologist to do what they could probably do by hand if they had enough time. Um, they, can, they can count synapses, they can measure um, cell widths and so on. Um, but these are really just accelerating about what a biologist can do. This last one is actually going into a different domain. It's really a data science where a biologist, you can't hand them a million images and say, group these images so that the similar ones look like are, are nearby each other in, in, a, in a, a high dimensional space, right? So that's what our goal here is in profiling. And why would you want to do this? Well, it turns out there are um, at least a dozen applications of this kind of profiling approach across the drug discovery pipeline. So going from assay to development, to testing chemicals, to identifying a chemical and improving it, to testing it um, in preclinical models and then eventually in clinical trials and then eventually getting to a drug. There's all kinds of steps. I won't describe any of them, but you can, you can see that there's um, applications along this pipeline. I'm just going to pick one in the pipeline um, to talk about where we... Um, are developing better disease-based assays. So the way we're using profiling here is to identify signatures of disease and then test drugs to try to reverse the signature. And keep in mind, in an academic institution, we have hundreds of thousands of, of compounds that could be useful drugs. In a pharma company, they literally have millions of compounds that they can test. So really the challenge is to come up with a, um, an assay system, a set of cells under certain conditions to, um, to then screen. So let me give you a really concrete example. Even if you're outside biology, this, this should be understandable to you. So basically, you take some cells, grow them in a dish. They're happy, healthy cells. You stain them for some different stains to look at some of their structures. And then let's say you knock out a gene that is known to cause a human disorder, such as CCM. Cerebral ca cavernous malformation is a stroke disorder. 
that's hereditary. We know the gene that causes it. When you knock that gene out in a human, they get the disease. When you knock that gene out in cells, they look like this. And you don't need to be a biologist to say, okay, something's off about these cells. They don't look happy. Um, or maybe they, they look different, let's just say. And so now you take a large set of samples that are in the disease state, and you just test a lot of drugs to see, can we find any drugs that make the unhealthy cells look healthy again? So it's really that simple, um, this approach. A lot of people didn't think this approach would work, but um, researchers at the University of Utah um, showed, a, showed one of those examples of it working and then launched a company that I now um, help on and that has led to those four clinical trials I mentioned um, because now they have hundreds of disease um, scenarios here, um, hundreds of genes that they've knocked down to identify what looks what looks off about the cells when these when these genes are missing. Um, that compare that to a kind of traditional biomedical research um, strategy where you just take um, years many times to to develop a, a model system to figure out what kind of cells do I want to use, what kind of stains do I want to use. Um, it's incredibly tedious by comparison. And back in my own lab, a neat experiment that we've been able to do that follows the same strategy is in collaboration with McLean Hospital. Bruce Cohen and Donna McPhee there have carefully collected a set of patients who are willing to participate in this research where they donate their cells. And um, if you just take healthy um, control patients that don't have a mental illness, you can um, see where they see how the cells look in this phenotypic space. So using the clustering algorithms that I described before, well, not clustering, just positioning them in this high dimensional space. This is what the healthy cells look like. Whereas if you take cells from patients with bipolar disorder, you see that there's a region of this phenotypic space um, that is missing. So the axes don't really mean anything here. It's just a representation of the space. And you can see that even better when you uh, overlay the two colors. You can see there's a region in blue here where there's just a certain, a, a certain way that cells look, that they often look for healthy patients, and they just don't look that way for bipolar patients. So we're pretty excited. These are very small numbers um, of patients that we have here, um, but we were able to replicate um, the same phenotype in a set of schizoaffective patients, which are very similar. Schizophrenia, you don't see it so much, but we were um, very interested to see that in um, patients with depression, which is sort of the opposite of these other um, phenotypes, we see that population of cells comes back a bit here, and there's a population that's more missing on this side of the plot now, which is actually enriched a bit in schizophrenia and bipolar polar disorder. So we're seeing kind of a mechanistically consistent um, change in how the cells look when they are um, coming from patients that are experiencing these different disorders. So what's great about this is that instead of um, trying to, um, these, these diseases are very difficult to study because it's hard to grow neurons in dishes and it's um, difficult to know what, what do we want the neurons to do that will improve these behavioral um, problems for patients. And now that we have a very very easy to measure thing. What we're measuring, the, the actual phenotype that we're looking at here has to do with how the mitochondria are positioned within the, within the cell. Um, that's a very simple phenotype to be able to measure, and now we can test drugs against it. Uh, and then one last example, again, along these same lines, is a collaboration with Miko Taipale at the University of Toronto and Jessica Lacoste. They took um, uh, cells that are happy, healthy cells growing in a dish. They labeled a, a certain protein that's known to be associated with a disease. And the healthy version of that um, protein is shown here in green. And the unhealthy version of that protein is shown here on the right. And so just that, that one mutation that we know patients have causes that protein to be in the wrong place in the cell. And so again, our goal will be in this experiment to test existing drugs to reverse that um, appearance of the cells, and then um, genetic perturbations to find potential targets and pathways that are involved in these disorders. So behind the scenes here on these profiling projects, we have a couple of computational libraries. These are not intended for biologists to, to use um, who, are not, who don't have computational skills. But the goal is basically to go from images to these um, downstream analyses. And this involves a lot of normalization and batch effect correction and so on. Uh, and, and some of the details of these projects are shown here involving um, R and Python as well as, um, as a um, deep learning based profiling strategy that goes straight from raw images to uh, the relationships that we're looking for on a single cell level. 
So as, as, as promised, I will not take you through the other dozen kinds of things you can do with image-based profiling. And um, again, here's, here's the link to the um, PDF of the slides. It's also at the beginning of the chat in the, in the SciPy interface. Um, this broad.io slash carpenter slide. This is where you can go to um, download these slides if you want to take a look at any of these kinds of papers. There's also um, some conferences that you might be interested in if this field is, is interesting to you. Um, I just wanted to close again with some of the softer side of things. Um, if you're uh, computational and you're interested in getting involved in biomedical data science and engineering, um, first of all, you can come work at the Broad. It's a nonprofit. It's academic and has, um, unlike many biomedical institutions, has a tremendous data science and software focus and especially machine learning as well. You can work on a public data challenge. There's all kinds of them that you can Google and you can contribute to a code base, please. Um, if you're transitioning in the other direction um, from biology to more computational work, and I, I say this, sorry, I shouldn't say biology because I know many of, of you who are listening today are coming from some domain into computation and you're probably feeling a little imposter syndrome. You're probably feeling um, like every, everybody else must know more than you do. Um, some of the challenges of going, of, of making this transition, I, I can relate to because my own self, I was trained as a cell biologist and have entered this field of computation. Um, first, it's here's all the reasons why it's challenging. I guess I don't need to elaborate those. Um, but the benefits, just major impact. Working at the interface of, of two fields can just be tremendously impactful. So I really encourage people in this direction. Um, you'll have a different work life pattern if you're doing computational work as opposed to biology, where um, the timing of experiments is critical and you're feeding cells over the weekends and, and evenings. Um, it's a very different um, pattern of life. It's very collaborative, I think is one of the biggest benefits that I, I find, um, especially having to improve your communication skills across these boundaries is just a great life skill to have. And lastly, the same as the first, just major impact. Um, some of the resources that I recommend for people making the transition from um, into computation are, are shown here and then into, into biology there. And um, in particular, this article is not available yet. It's coming out tomorrow, um, but it's an article describing how, how I per just a personal story of how I made the transition from a particular domain into the computational sciences. So hopefully that will be interesting to you as well. So with that, thank you so much for your attention today. Here's the links again to the slides if you'd like those um, to get some of these um, different resources that I've mentioned. There's also um, a, a Twitter um, thread that I started in case you especially have technical questions that the software engineer on our team can can help to answer um, so thank you very much that's was fantastic thank you very much Ann. Uh, I, we have a few minutes for questions so let me pull up. Uh, oh, good. We've got some votes. So we've got some ranking. Uh, Python faces a tough competition from Julia as far as speed up is concerned for scientific computing. Julia is slowly gaining popularity, especially in this domain. What's your take on this? Ask Shivam. Oh, I don't have an opinion. <laughs> I don't have an opinion on, on languages. I, I think it's, um, it is important to consider the domain though, or the application. I, I don't think it's sensible to say um, A is better than B or A is um, faster than B. It really depends so much on the scenario that you intend um, to apply the code and, um, and, the, and the constraints. I mean, I think the software that we've written would be very different if, um, if we only had to serve users that had piles of 10 images instead of a million. Um, and links to AWS. And if deep learning had never come along, then um, we could stay in our happy little world for a much longer time. But um, I think the, the flexibility to the user base and to the external conditions changing in the world, I think generally argues for having a, a sort of open and flexible attitude about language. And you can see that in, our, in, in my lab, we've certainly um, run the gamut of different kinds of languages that we've been open to using. Great, thank you. Uh, does cell profiler handle time series? For example, tracking the individual growth of a number of cells across images, would deep learning help in that respect, both to recognize cells and to analyze growth patterns? Yes, yeah, so cell profiler handles multi-dimensional images and that can be time-lapse and it can be 3D as well. Um, and, um, 
can deep learning help? Absolutely. But, but typically, um, I, I would say the vast majority of biologists that are working with um, three-dimensional data, it's usually really huge data, like terabyte scale, um, um, very long time lapse, um, very large three-dimensional kinds of um, projects for which our tools are probably not helpful. So most of our tools are geared, geared towards this high throughput world where you have a lot of samples, but each one is kind of manageable. If you've got enormous images, um, it's just a bit outside the comfort zone. And typically, you're going to need to write something a bit more customized in order to extract the dynamic features that you care about from a project like that. Uh, Raha Desgai asks, how are you surveying users? And, and my recollection from when this question came in, I believe it was in reference to the surveys you'd done about what language to uh, write cell profiler in and, and what features to focus on for the software, if I recall correctly. And the question is, how do we serve users or how do we survey? How do you them? survey them? How do we survey them? Yeah. So um, I, I forget what platform we've used, um, like, you know, SurveyMonkey or whatever the, the typical um, survey tools are, if, that, if that's the question. Um, but then to just spread the word, we um, will send out, We at times we've had email lists for the software um, and um, making making the survey known through tw through Twitter. But I think the crucial thing is to not just survey the people who are using your software, but instead to survey the community of people that you maybe wish were using your software or you, you feel the world would be a better place if they adopted it. Um, trying to get connected to those communities um, is, is really a, your best bet. Great. Uh, this question got a couple of comments from other people, so it's possible it's been answered. But are the images captured with different light sources, wavelengths of light, infrared, et cetera, et cetera? And are they raw or something like JPEG? Ah, okay. So we try to not have people use JPEG just because it's a lossy format. Um, but to answer the question more generally, people use all kinds of images um, with Cell Profiler. People have um, analyzed not just the microscopy images that I showed a lot of examples of. Some of those were bright fields. Some of them were fluorescence. Um, you can do electron microscopy as well. Um, but people have used um, this kind of tool to... Um, process footprints, uh, mice that have ink on their on their foot, uh, on their paws, running around on a piece of paper um, in a, one particular experiment, I remember, or um, measuring materials in material science, measuring impurities in samples, um, measuring how much snow is on solar panels and, and so on. So, um, the, you know, images are images. And although we've built this for a biology community, there really isn't anything that's that's highly unique um, to, to this domain. Great. Uh, Gwen asks, what kind of microscopy techniques do you typically use in drug discovery? Well, um, in drug discovery, the microscopy techniques that, that is most common is light microscopy. And for, for high throughput screening specifically, we like to keep it pretty simple. So it's, it typically is three or four or five colors um, that are measured using a, a light microscope in a single static 2D image, um, the, keeping it really simple. Um, that being said, there's other kinds of, if, you if you're doing a low throughput experiment in biomedicine, um, you have a tremendous array of options. You can um, make little organoids that represent um, brains or mammary glands or kidneys, and those can be pretty realistic in terms of the tissues interacting with each other in a dish. And so there you might want to do 3D um, and, and so on. So there's, uh, I would say, quite a big variety. Okay. Uh, Kelvin asks, are, as we're maturing in our views on unsupervised learned representations, we're seeing these representations are not what we think they should be, as well as being overconfident in incorrect predictions. Are there any problems that you know of slash foresee for using deep learning in cell analysis? Yeah, that's a great question. So unsupervised learning has had, um, I'm not going to say it has a troubled past, but it's definitely, we have not seen it be very useful up until recently, I would say, in my particular domain. Um, so there's so many features that we measure from cells, and many of them are quite redundant. And so you have um, a lot of feature weighting problems that make the unsupervised um, space not particularly helpful. However, um, one, one uh, we've started to make some headway, and by we, I mean the field as a whole, has started to make some headway, especially with some of the deep learning techniques, such as weekly supervised learning. I think you have to tell the system, you know, if I if I took the 16, uh, 1,693 attendees of this um, session and said, hey, group these people, um, 
you know, what, how would you position people in space? You could, you could position them by hair color and skin color. You could position them by where they got their PhD or um, whether they had a PhD. Um, you could position them by what they had for breakfast. And so this multidimensional space is so um, enormous. You really have to, I think for unsupervised techniques to work well, you need to provide some guidance of what is it that you care about most. Um, that grouping, if it's time for lunch, then my grouping might be based on, you know, when's the last time you ate as opposed to what your hair color is. Um, and so um, those are, I think, the kinds of things that we're learning in, in the biomedical domain is that giving the um, giving the system some kind of knowledge about what matters. And we, we actually have many ways to do this. For example, if we take um, the, the 6,000 existing drugs, four to 6,000 existing drugs in the world, um, some of them have been withdrawn, some of them are still active, and we treat cells with that, we can tell the system, um, hey, there's all kinds of differences in how cells look, but the differences that make one drug look different from another, those are probably more important than some of the other differences that may exist numerically with, when you look at the sample set. And so it's just an example of how um, we can use outside information to guide the system to be a little smarter about how it does the relatively unsupervised clustering. That's great. Thank you so much for this. Um, we do have a few more questions in the chat, but I think we're, we're running pretty late here and need to get queued up for uh, the Q&A sessions this afternoon. Uh, hopefully, um, the, the people we didn't get a chance to get to can reach out to you uh, either uh, via Slack or uh, via the, your contact information. Um, I personally really, uh, this, this talk was fantastic, a really nice combination of, of science and software development and data science and really beautiful work. My pleasure.